Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Let's face it, schools are creepy places. Elementary schools, junior high schools, secondary schools, universities, it doesn't matter. As soon as the buildings are empty, the place is eerie. Why is this? While there are definitely deaths that happen at schools, you wouldn't think that spirits would stay or return to their alma mater as an eternal haunt. Off the top of my head, the only other type of building that seems to hold this constant feeling of creepiness is a theater. Once the audience is left and the theater is empty, each theater I've ever been in holds a certain residual energy, almost like the building itself is watching you. While it's nearly impossible for every school and every theater to have active hauntings, possibly because these buildings are centers of so much energy, both physical and psychic, they retain a certain residual haunting. However, that certainly doesn't erase active hauntings completely as the culprit for some of the eeriness lurking in the halls of empty schools or theaters. And what if a building has previously served as both a school and theater? Would that increase the likelihood that the spirits of previous students or audience members would stay? Would they interact with each other? No matter what, it's pretty much a guarantee that a building which has served as both a school and a theater would hold strong energies that would leave strong and lasting impressions on modern visitors. Paranormality Magazine contributor Billy White tells us about the Mira Theater, the haunting there with spirits of schoolchildren and performers. The building that sits on the waterfront at 51 Daniels Avenue in Vallejo, California, was originally constructed in the early 1900s as the Bay Terrace School. At the time, Vallejo was a Navy town, and most of life centered around the Navy base located just across a small bridge on Mare Island. When it opened its doors in 1918, the Bay Terrace School hosted 180 students in grades 1 through 6. As the base expanded, so did the city of Vallejo and the number of students who needed to attend schools. By 1957, Bay Terrace was too small to justify it being kept open, and it was closed. It just so happened that at the same time, the Mare Island Recreation Association, or MIRA, was looking for a new theater. The MIRA Theater Guild was originally established as a performing group in 1943. The concept behind the group was to allow service members on Mare Island a chance to meet off base and perform. Like the rest of Vallejo, the Myra Theater Guild expanded quickly, and by the late 1950s it had outgrown traveling from stage to stage and was looking for a theater to call its own. The Myra dropped the connection to Mare Island and became more of a community organization in the mid-1980s, but remained the Myra Theater Guild, now in honor of the major star in the Cetus constellation. After signing the lease to the Bay Terrace Theater, the Myra Theater Group continued to thrive under the direction of Dolly Nunn for years. Dolly had very clear ideas on the performing arts that she wanted to see at the Myra Building. In fact, it's believed that Dolly's spirit continues to monitor the operations in the building. Clearly, the building and the group has needed to adapt and adjust to the changing times. What brings in audiences now was not what drew crowds in the 1960s or even the 1980s. Just a few years ago, the Myra Group was investigating the idea of hosting more movie festivals, something extremely popular throughout the Bay Area. With members of the board present following a discussion about hosting more movies and films, an entire case of glassware shattered. 
While the board members were not afraid, they quickly assumed that Dolly was still around and letting the building know that she absolutely did not approve of moving away from live theater. It's absolutely no coincidence that the room where the glassware exploded is the Dolly Nunn room. Dolly is definitely not the only ghost who still resides in the Myra building. Also, according to visitors and current staff, the ghosts who are around are not only from the building's theater days. There are clearly some students who have stayed behind. Speaking to staff and previous guests, there are multiple reports of children running down the halls and in many of the former classrooms which now serve as dressing and meeting rooms. On Halloween 2022, I had the opportunity to investigate the Myra building with my team. First, it has to be said that it is an absolutely stunning building. It's an old school turned theater that manages to feel both comfortable as it embraces its antique roots while also feeling exciting with new artwork by local artists. The main thing that stands out for the Myra building is this is a location that stands out to me as having the most clearly interactive EVP using a spirit box. There have been many stories about what is now the gentleman's restroom. When the building was a school, the room still was the boys' restroom. While asking questions with our spirit box, one of the questions that we asked was, what day is today? We immediately got a response, Halloween. Also, when we asked if the spirit could tell us their name, we got the response, Paul. Granted, it is possible that our box was picking up radio signals, but two intelligent responses was extremely exciting. The greatest thing about our investigation, at least for us, was that we had a huge learning experience about Polaroids and light with shadows. I love to use Polaroid cameras on investigations because you can't fake a Polaroid. I also love their simplicity and just the use of them. We took two photos that gave us pause at the Myra building. Each of the photos that we took were in shadowy rooms with the Polaroid flash and a mirror behind one of the investigators. In each of the photos, we found a shadow in the mirror that was facing away from the person being reflected. There was no way that the shadow matched the person living who was clearly in the photograph. Or so we thought. After some more investigation, we discovered that there is a natural phenomenon with Polaroids, light flashes, shadows, and mirrors that play tricks on our brain. When you put all of these ingredients together, it's very likely that you will get some creepy-looking photos with shadows that do not match the objects in the photo. While this was disappointing, we were hoping for some amazing proof of the supernatural, it was also a fascinating rabbit hole and new fact about Polaroid cameras and film. For us, it was a relatively quiet investigation. This definitely does not mean that there is not plenty of activity in this beautiful building. I think the Myra building is a perfect example of possible paranormal activity that exists for its own purposes and not to entertain guests or visitors. We had the opportunity to interview a man who has worked with Myra for many years. He'd witnessed the glass breaking and possible Dolly Nunn reaction to the introduction of film to her theater. He told us that they've had paranormal investigators come through the building throughout the years. There is definitely a presence there. He has felt and heard many things throughout the entire theater. Like many other theaters, things go missing. Lights turn off and on. Noises are heard throughout the entire theater. While the building doesn't have any single story of a death or tragedy, it is a beautiful old building. I could see why a spirit of a former student teacher, actor, or theater patron might want to return and make this their eternal residence. Everyone loves a good witch story. Paranormality Magazine's Elaine Kelly and a team of paranormal investigators she works with decided to travel to Pendle to learn more about them. This is what she wrote. I arranged to meet with an expert who did tours of the area, and he agreed to take us to Clithero Castle and then on to Pendle Hill. In September 2021, we made our way south towards Lancashire and arrived early, so we had some time to kill before we could get into our accommodation. We visited a fabulous shop and the church in Newchurch. 
These areas are relevant to the story because the village was caught up in the largest witch hunt in English legal history in the early 17th century. St. Mary's Church in the village is steeped in history. The Eye of God is built into the west side of the tower. To the east of the porch, up against the south wall, is the alleged grave carved with a skull and crossbones of Alice Nutter, one of the famous Pendle witches. But before I go into what happened that night, here is the story of the Pendle witches. The official publication of the proceedings by the clerk to the court, Thomas Potts, in his The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster, and the number of witches hanged together, nine Lancaster and one at York, make the trials unusual for England at that time. It's been estimated that all the English witch trials between the early 15th and early 18th centuries resulted in fewer than 500 executions. This series of trials accounted for more than 2% of that total. On the 18th of August, 1612, a bustling courtroom heard the cries of a mother as she begged her own daughter to spare her life. At only nine years old, Janet Device was the key witness in the trial of the Pendle Witches. Twelve villagers were accused and ten of them executed, four of whom were part of Jeanette's immediate family. For years, a feud had been in place between Jeanette's grandmother, Old Demdike, and the other local healing woman, Old Chaddix. This feud had started over ten years prior and had allegedly resulted in the death of Jeanette's father, John. However, this feud would have no real effect on the escalation of the witch hunt, only serving as a demonstration of the dark works associated with the families. Suspicion fell onto the Device family initially through Jeanette's older sister, Alison, who was arrested in March for cursing a peddler and, with the help of a familiar, causing him to fall into a witchcraft-induced illness. She had encountered John Law on a walk through Trodden Forest, where she asked him for some pins. The desiring of pins is what interested prosecutors, as at the time pins were heavily associated with witchcraft and were often cited as evidence of dark magic in other trials. Upon being refused, a black dog appeared to Alison, and she cursed Law. He subsequently suffered a stroke, but managed to get to the nearest town. Despite Law not making any accusations, it appears that Alison was convinced of her own powers, confessing to the crime and begging forgiveness from him. After preliminary questioning of other members of the Demdike and Chaddix families, a meeting was arranged for Good Friday at Malkin Tower, the home of Jeanette Device, where the suspicions of the judges and Alison's arrest were to be discussed. All those invited were anxious to avoid the prosecutor's suspicion. The date of the meeting was also curious to the judges, as in Protestant England, Good Friday was still a day of mourning, not a meeting of friends with a sheep being slaughtered for the occasion. It was in this inquiry that nine-year-old Jeanette Device emerged as a key witness who, by virtue of her age, could not be complicit in the actions of her family or those surrounding her. According to Jeanette, the meeting was called to give a name to Alison's familiar and decided that all those who attended, including her family, were witches. The words of a nine-year-old girl resulted in the death of her grandmother and the execution of her mother, sister, and brother for crimes we know today were never truly committed. The substance of the examinations of the so-called witches and others may be given as follows. Old Demdike persuaded her daughter, Elizabeth Device, to sell herself to the devil, which she did, and in turn initiated her daughter, Alison Device, in these infernal arts. Amongst the rest of the voluntary confessions made by the witches, that of Dame Demdike is preserved. She confessed that about twenty years ago she was coming home from begging, she was met near Goldshea in the forest of Pendle by the spirit of a devil in the shape of a boy, the one half of his coat black and the other brown, who told her to stop and said that if she would give him her soul, she would have anything she wished for. She asked his name and was told, Tib. She consented, from the hope of gain, to give him her soul. For several years, she had no occasion to make any application to her evil spirit, but one Sunday morning, having a little child upon her knee and she being in a slumber, the spirit appeared to her in the likeness of a brown dog and forced himself upon her knee and began to suck blood under her left arm, on which she exclaimed, Jesus, save me! 
and the brown dog vanished, leaving her almost stark mad for eight weeks. On another occasion, she was led, being blind, to the house of Richard Baldwin to obtain payment for the services her daughter had performed at his mill, when Baldwin fell into a passion and bid them to get off his ground, calling them whores and witches and saying he would burn the one and hang the other. On this, Tib appeared, and they concerted matters to revenge themselves on Baldwin. How is not stated. Now for the investigation, which we started at Clitheroe Castle. Its earliest history is debated, but it's thought to be of Norman origin, probably built in the 12th century. Property of the de Lacy family, the honor later merged with the earldom and then the Duchy of Lancaster. Given to George Monk, first Duke of Albemarle in 1660, the castle site remained in private ownership until 1920, when it was sold to the people of Clitheroe to create a war memorial. Today, the buildings on the site are the home of Clitheroe Castle Museum. We were conducting a mini-investigation of the castle grounds, doing spirit photography. We very much had a sense that we were being watched. When I checked the photos that we had taken, we had what we believed to be the spirit looking at us from the stairway. After we had investigated there, we made our way back toward the cars. There wasn't anyone around us, and again I was taking photos with my full-spectrum camera. I caught what looked like a figure walking in front of me. There wasn't anyone there, as I won't take photographs when visitors are around. We jumped into the car and followed the guide up Pendle Hill towards where Malkin Tower is meant to have been. The guide was about to leave us to our own devices, but before he did he happened to mention that when he was stood on the same spot with another paranormal team, a tooth was thrown at them from out of nowhere. He hadn't got the words out of his mouth when something hard was thrown at me and bounced off my arm. We couldn't find what it was as the grass was quite long. Was it a tooth? We will never know. When the guide left, I turned on the portal and spirit box. Immediately, a man's voice said, Hidden tooth, and a woman's voice said, Keep tooth there. We asked various questions, trying to find anything that linked the witches to the area and to see if this was Mulking Tower, but they wouldn't comment on it. Whilst doing a live video on the site, there was a child speaking through the portal. The child was talking about a priest and needing help. Jeanette was only nine years old when she was sentenced. Could this have been her? We ventured further into the darkness towards a ledge that resembled a quarry. We picked up on an aircraft, crashing. We started to ask questions, and when I did research afterwards, we found that the portal had said things that indeed linked to a crash. I also felt that I received a blow to the face. There was a mark left there, but I wasn't sure if I was feeling the impact of the crash. F.O. John R. Runnels was flying the third aircraft in a flight of five P-47s on a ferry flight from East Retham to Wharton, the other pilots being Captain Charles Francis, the flight leader, Lieutenant Giles, Second Lieutenant Donald L. Mosher, and Lieutenant Johnson. Captain Francis had been given clearance to lead the flight of P-47s to Wharton for modification, although weather conditions were far from ideal, it was his decision to proceed. He was the only member of the group with any experience of British weather conditions and navigation over wartime England. Some ten minutes later, at 14.10 hours, the weather officer reported that conditions over the destination, Wharton, had deteriorated and managed to contact Captain Francis just before his flight took off and informed him of the change in conditions and advised him not to go. Despite this, he insisted on continuing, and at 14.50 hours, the flight taxied out and took off. Immediately after takeoff, Lieutenant Giles was unable to find the flight and proceeded alone. The others continued, but on approaching Liverpool, they ran into zero visibility and were forced to fly on instruments. At this point, 2nd Lieutenant Mosher lost contact with the flight and subsequently managed to land a ringway. What happened to F. L. Rennells from this point is unclear, but it seems probable he also became separated from the flight in the fog and continued on instruments, probably hoping to find a break in the cloud until his fuel ran out. Examination of the remains of his aircraft at the time found no sign of fire and evidence that the fuel tanks were dry. Also, the oil covering the engine was not affected by heat, which it would have been if the engine was running and still hot at the time of the crash. 
Finally, no propeller gouges were found along the path made by the aircraft as it struck the ground. Ironically, Runnels had managed to clear the summit of Pendle Hill and in fact appeared to be attempting a forced landing on the far side, but came down short and broke up as it hit the rough moorland going down the side of the hill. The wreck was reported as salvage on the 21st of February 1944, though parts remained for many years, including the pilot's back armor, which is believed to have been recovered some years ago and is still held locally. Sadly, the tragedy on this day did not end with the death of F.O. Runnels, as Captain Francis's P-47, 42-8621, dived into the ground on approach to the flight's intended destination. Wharton, at 1630 hours, was also killed. F.O. John R. Runnels from Pennsylvania is buried at the Cambridge American Cemetery, Cambridge, England. Plot F, Row 3, Grave 100. Captain Charles Francis lies nearby. We picked up on a Charlie and the portal said, the plane's gone. The names of the witches at the Great Assembly and Feast in Malkin Tower on Good Friday in 1612 are as follows. Elizabeth Device, Alice Nutter, Catherine Hewitt, alias Mold Heels, John Bullcock, Jane Bullcock, Alice Gray of Padaham, Jeanette Hargraves, Elizabeth Hargraves, Christopher Howgate, Christopher Hargraves, son of Demdike, Grace Hay of Padaham, Anne Crunchy of Marsden, Elizabeth Howgate, and Jeanette Preston, executed at York for the murder of Mr. Lister. The portal voices said Allison and Grace. It also said Grace is dead, murderers, Alice is boss, my name's Robert, Bob, and Annie killed. The voices from the portal also said Rich, Dog, and Zip It, were they perhaps referring to Dame Demdike's dog? The trials of the Pendle Witches in 1612 are among the most famous witch trials in English history, and some of the best recorded of the 17th century. The twelve accused lived in the area surrounding Pendle Hill in Lancashire and were charged with the murders of ten people for the use of witchcraft. All but two were tried at Lancaster Assizes on August 18th and 19th, 1612, along with the Samselbury witches and others in a series of trials that have become known as the Lancashire Witch Trials. One was tried at York Assizes on July 27, 1612, and another died in prison. Of the eleven who went to trial, nine women and two men, ten were found guilty and executed by hanging. One was found not guilty. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. One of Paranormality Magazine's readers decided to send in a story of their own. Jersey Beth sent in Gertie's Red Pen. Here's her story. When I visited Gertie for lunch at the nursing home, she told me she was ready to die. What do you think happens when we die? I asked. She scoffed. Nothing, she said with a dismissive wave. Lights out. It was this kind of incisive brevity I loved about her. Gertie and I had gotten to know each other editing the nursing home's newsletter. I was the English major come receptionist. She was the retired secretary. Gertie was unmarried 
had no children and no family in the area. The newsletter gave her purpose and gave me a creative outlet. We were a couple of administrative pros, separated by a couple of generations and a shared disinterest in Comic Sans. You couldn't add an extra space after a period in any community publication without Gertie finding out. She carried a ruler in her handbag to measure margins on the go. And Lord help you if you started a sentence with a conjunction. My shift had started at 3 p.m. and Gertie would be promptly at my desk at 3.01, a stack of papers on her walker, a red pen tucked behind her ear, and a look of disdain. Poetry is unamusing, yet we're obligated to publish it, she said, licking her index finger and flipping through the first few pages. Can you have these retyped before I come down for dinner at 4.30? Absolutely, I said. And I always did. We had continued this song and dance of newsletter editing week after week for over a year. By the second year, Gertie would arrive in a wheelchair at my desk at 3.02, a stack of papers in her lap, a red pen tucked in a messy bun, and a look of defeat. It's yours now, she said one day, handing me a rough copy of the upcoming week's submissions. The pages rattled in her quivering hands. Narrow margins, 0.5 inch, don't forget. She nodded pointedly at me, a little smirk on her face, making sure I understood. I did. By the following week, I had a polished, crisp, freshly printed copy of the final newsletter and had looked forward to surprising Gertie on my day off. Instead, I woke up with a start, realizing my alarm hadn't gone off and that my lights were out. My cell phone hadn't charged. That had never happened before. Everything was suddenly dead. My heart was pounding and I felt disoriented. I felt a nagging urge to get to the nursing home quickly. I scrambled to get myself ready and into the car, the dashboard clock reading 8.30. With the newsletter on the seat next to me, I raced to the office, taking the stairs to bypass the elevator and go straight to her side of the unit. As I knocked and peered into her room, I was surprised to see that it had already been cleaned out. A new pair of sheets on the bed, like fresh paper. There was the faint smell of bleach. I looked into the hallway and confirmed the room number. Where does she go? I asked a passing nurse. Did someone change the font on the menus again? The nurse's face fell. She looked at her clipboard and tapped a note saying, Oh no, Gertrude passed away last night. It was in her sleep. Well, I'll be darned. I looked up at the ceiling with a smirk. Lights out, eh? Thank you. I know you cared for her well. The nurse gave a somber nod in reply and continued walking. She had a red pen tucked behind her ear. It was just that kind of subtle wit I loved about Gertie. I left her room, turning the lights out behind me. I had a newsletter to publish. For centuries, humans claim to have interacted with aliens or extraterrestrials. Some say they have met them physically, some claim to have been abducted, and still others claim to be able to contact them telepathically and at will think CE5. In recent years, we have also seen a rise in possible contact with military personnel from all over the world. Only in the last few years they have been videoed by U.S. Navy pilots and now we have three ex-military officers having given a sworn testimony to Congress about their sightings of UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomena. Times are indeed a changin'. Paranormality magazine contributor Michaela Ford tells us about preparing for an alien invasion. If, as many in the UFO world have predicted for some time, we are being primed for imminent alien contact, perhaps we'd better know a little more about who or what we're dealing with. With that in mind, here follows a simple breakdown of some of the alleged types of extraterrestrial beings people have claimed to be in contact with over the last 100 years. Grays Gray-skinned humanoids, reportedly ranging from 3 to 7 feet tall, hairless, with large heads, black almond-shaped eyes, nostrils without a nose, slits for mouths, 
no ears, and three to four fingers, including thumb. Greys have been reported as the predominant extraterrestrial beings of so-called alien contact since the 1960s. The Roswell Incident, Betty and Barney Hill, Aerial School, Rua, Zimbabwe. They are the alleged baddies of the alien races and are interested in experimenting on humans and animals. These guys are the most reported types to abduct humans and rarely seem to be interested in the feelings of our kind, more likely to look upon us as animals. Hopkinsville Goblins Small humanoids with long arms, monkeyish features, wide-set eyes, and pointed ears. They were reported to have attacked a family and friends who were staying together in a farmhouse in Hellier, Kentucky on August 21, 1955. The beings reportedly tried to gain entry to the property after a saucer-shaped craft was seen shortly beforehand. This was an isolated incident, despite copycat reports ensuing intermittently for a short time. The case was reopened in 2019 by Dana and Greg Newkirk in the TV docuseries Hellier. Nordics Humanoids with stereotypical Scandinavian features, similar to the peoples of Norway, Sweden, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, etc. They are reported as being tall, with blonde hair and blue eyes, and have featured in several cases of contact, especially by children. It is said they are from ancient Earth, but presenting themselves as extraterrestrials. In the past, they moved from living on the surface to living underground around the Himalayas area after a natural event. Some people believe they are humans from the future who have found a way to time travel. Others believe they are in charge of the greys. They are often reported to warn our civilization about the damage we are doing to the Earth. Reptilians – Tall, Scaly Humanoids The believed existence of reptilian humanoid beings dates back at least as far as ancient Egypt, with the crocodile-headed river god Sobek. The reptilian conspiracy theory has been advocated by David Icke. The basis of the reptilian elite theory is that in ancient times a group of advanced reptiles from the Alpha Draconis star system came to Earth and infiltrated the governments of the ancient civilizations in order to control all the humans and enslave them and become their rulers and bred with other humans to form crossbreeds so that their DNA can infiltrate the minds of humans. Whatever you believe, it can't be argued that developing human embryos do look like reptiles. Is this a throwback to our evolutionary past, or an incontrovertible clue as to our true nature? Rods or Skyfish Elongated visual images appearing in photos and video recordings, sometimes claimed to be extraterrestrial beings. Some people believe they are a type of diaphanous, glowing creature a bit like a sky jellyfish. They can appear to be illuminated from within, iridescent, transparent or translucent, with an internal bioluminescent type glow. It has been pondered as to whether these creatures are in our skies all the time, simply dipping in and out of view at will, or whether they can travel interdimensionally via portals. Ultra Terrestrials UTs, not ETs Popular with many illustrious researchers and theologians such as Mead Lane, John Keel, Jacques Vallée, and J. Allen Hynek, the interdimensional UFO hypothesis argues that extraterrestrials may come from other dimensions here on Earth rather than other planets. They believe that the beings may be able to shapeshift or transform their appearance to suit the situation and that they have lived alongside humans for all time. This theory would explain why there have been sightings of spacecraft and their occupants reported back as far as human history itself. There have been many reports of people communicating telepathically with ultra-terrestrial beings, and some believe they can be summoned to interact with human beings. Think Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind. Appearing to be able to materialize and dematerialize at will, the beings are reported to be able to move between dimensions pass through solid matter, and survive incredible speed of travel whilst on our plane. This list is by no means exhaustive, as connected ideas such as Native American or ancient Sumerian beliefs, 
hybrid humans, or modern incarnations such as the Men in Black would turn this from an article into a tome of a book. Such is the wealth of information out there. Suffice it to say, there are an overwhelming amount of reports, documents, and theses on the subject, enough to keep any alien hunter going for several lifetimes, and we haven't even mentioned the military. Next time you see an unusual light in the sky or spot a pop star's eyes glitch to reptilian in front of your face, stop and think of this quote from the writings of Metrodorus of Chios from the 4th century BCE. To consider the Earth as the only populated world in infinite space is as absurd as to assert that in an entire field sown with millet only one grain will grow. Then run and grab your tinfoil hat. Paranormality Magazine loves getting submissions from their readers. In fact, many of their readers are pretty creative. They get poems quite often. For example, this one by Gina Black entitled This Haunted House. The years have been less than kind, despite her best efforts. Pride once beamed from her very foundation, undeniably noticed by anyone who walked her interior. She loved so deeply once upon a time, only to have her heart ripped away. Does anyone remember? She wonders how they could forget. Her vibrant paint, now a faded shroud, the windows void of their former glow. Love and laughter once permeated her halls, a distant memory that feels stale somehow as of late. When they moved on, she was left behind. They had no idea. Their very pulse was what kept her alive. Some speculate the creaks and groans are the result of age, or perhaps the cold winds that creep inside. What if they're wrong, and it is her old bones sobbing for what once was? Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.